If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech to live by Hello, and welcome to the Populist Dialogues, a project of the Alliance for Democracy. Our purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. I'm your host, David Delk. Today we have video from an address recorded at the First Unitarian Church recently of an event sponsored by the Alliance for Democracy. The presenter is Thomas Lindsay. Thomas is founder and chief spokesperson for a Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. CELDEF has moved from being a traditional environmental law firm to one which defends communities' rights by enacting community rights ordinances acting first in Pennsylvania to enact laws which forbid corporate farming, they have passed such ordinances in over 150 communities, including in Pittsburgh, where the city council acted to ban fracking within their boundaries. Here is Thomas Lindsay. What's happening in the United States that communities are beginning to stand up as, uh, to reject a body of law, a structure of law, that guarantees that they will be fracked or drilled or have their water taken or have big box stores or have a variety of different thousand different things come into their community that they don't particularly want. You know, about the situation that we're currently in uh, as a country and as a globe uh, in terms of environmental issues. And so I put up a bunch of numbers like 570 million pounds of waste we produce in the United States each year, which is either incinerated or buried or uh, a variety of waste. That there are, we produce five million pounds of toxic waste in the United States uh, currently on an annual basis. Uh, that 90% of all forests have been logged in the United States. 90% of all original forests have been logged in the United States. Uh, 11 people now live within one mile of a Superfund site in the United States. 70% uh, of all biodiversity on the planet has now been extinguished. And so uh, the question is, why are we in the place that we're in? Uh, you know, I thought back in the 70s we passed these major environmental laws that were supposed to actually fix things. I don't know, maybe I was silly about that, but uh, it turns out 40 years later, by almost every environmental statistic in the country, we're now worse off than we were before the major environmental laws were passed in the United States. So something about our collective work just isn't working. In fact, it's making things worse, not better. And so that's not the understanding that we had when we came out of law school. We came out of law school and our heads were filled with professors telling us that the United States has the best environmental law, or law uh, laws in the world, best environmental laws in the world. In fact, they're so good that we export them out to other countries to replicate them in other countries. Uh, and in looking out the window, you know, law school, wherever we were, finding a deteriorated situation in which we're on the edge of, and in fact past the edge of ecological collapse, that we said, well, the problem can't be the environmental laws, it must be the fact that there's not enough people enforcing the laws. And so coming out of law school, we set up the law firm that I now work for, which is the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And we did it uh, basically for one reason, which was to enforce these great environmental laws that we have in the United States. And so for a number of years, we tried, for about six or seven years. Uh, we had about 300 clients, we did uh, permit appeals, we did enforcement of the National Environmental Policy Act, enforcing environmental impact statements, we did Clean Air Act litigation, we did Clean Water Act litigation, you name it. It didn't matter what the law was, basically. Uh, it had us in front of judges arguing that permits shouldn't have been issued by state governments when the permits issued, and arguing to judges that they should cost the permits out because they were missing something. In other words, that the permit wasn't complete underneath the regulatory framework. And uh, by and large, we would win those battles. And we had a win-loss record of 130 and 5. We were very good at what we did, uh, which was to go and make those arguments and try to find gaps and emissions and deficiencies in permit applications that corporations had submitted to try to get them popped out from uh, being, uh, being issued. And what would happen after we were successful in those uh, permit appeals and going through the environmental regulatory process was that the community group that we were working with would invite us back to their house for a victory party. So uh, communities working on stopping toxic waste incinerators, or landfills, or factory farms, or land applied sewage flood, or the thousands of different issues, single issues that communities face every day. We would go into court, argue over the regulatory stuff, try to get the permits shot out, and most of the times we were successful, and the community group would then ask us back to their house for a victory party. 
And they would say things like, wow, the system actually works for us. We came together around a kitchen table in our community. We decided we didn't want something here. We found a lawyer. We found a judge. The judge said reasonable things. The lawyer did a decent job. And now we're not going to get the toxic waste that's surrender anymore in our community or the factory or whatever. What would happen two months after that, of course, is that the corporation would come back. And this time, the corporation would use what we had done to find those gaps, deficiencies, emissions, things that were missing from the permit application, and they would fill them in. So they would submit a new bond, or do a new water study, or uh, sign a <coughs> petition, or do any of the things that environmental law is really dedicated to over the past 30 years, which is ostensibly attempting to enforce regulations that the corporations wrote in the first place against them. Because most of the regulatory frameworks that we have in the United States around the environmental laws were written by the very corporations that ostensibly those regulations are supposed to regulate. And so, as environmentalists, as folks that were, you know, lawyers representing these groups, um, the, the fact was uh, we were in a subordinate position trying to enforce something that someone else wrote. And that someone else that was writing it, these corporations, waste corporations, activists, corporations, you name it, have absolutely no interest in allowing us to have any degree of local control over whether those facilities come in or not. And so our life was an endless cycle of hamster wheel of sorts, uh, Groundhog Day, for those folks who have seen the movie with Bill Murray and who live the same day over and over again. That's the day that we lived, uh, which was assisting community groups to battle out the permit uh, appeal and regulatory confines, having the corporation come back after we had identified stuff and having the lawyers actually thank us for finding the pieces in the permit application that needed to be fixed, uh, and then coming back with a new application that was complete and met all the regulatory requirements, then having the community group come back to us and say, Mr. Lindsay, we need you to do that jujitsu again that you did the first time around to get the permit shot out, and us having to look back at people and say, well, we're sorry, there's no letters left anymore. We don't have anything to enforce because it's now the application is complete, the corporation has done everything it needs to do. And so uh, when you looked at our win loss record, which was 130, 128, and 5, whatever it was, you actually saw no resemblance between that win loss record and what was actually happening in our communities. The, they were getting the toxic waste incinerators and the factory farms and the sludge and everything else. We weren't stopping shit from coming in, literally. I mean, in the case of the we weren't stopping shit. Uh, it brought us to a dangerous set of conclusions after doing this for six or seven years. And a lot of that was popped and marked by someone named Jane Ann Morrison, uh, who's a writer who writes about our colonization, the fact that we have come to grips with the fact that we don't actually run this country. We don't even run our own communities for that matter. And she said something that stuck with me all the way through today. She said, the only thing that environmental regulations regulate are environmental because they make us predictable as to how we fight. The corporate boys have written the regulatory scheme, we walk into it, it's a script that's written for us, and we play by those rules because we're very obedient folks. And so we play in fora that have been established just for us to run around the wheel like a hamster until we get exhausted and our funding is gone and the lawyers leave and everything else. So it's, uh, to us, we were caught in that undertow. At least we thought we were costing the corporations money. You know, when we came in, you know, riding a white horse and uh, the Waste Management Corporation or one of the other companies that we were dealing with would hire their lawyers. Their lawyers cost $2,000 an hour or more. So we at least thought we were costing them money. And then I learned that the money that the corporations spend defending those permits is tax deductible. <laughs> As a reasonable and necessary business expense under the law. It's actually tax deductible. So it's structural. It's a structural advantage that they have. Not only is the burden on the community group to actually do the proof you know, to go through the materials and, and prove that the permit should have been issued. But the cost burden is on, is on communities that can't afford it. Uh, and let alone that, but structurally on the other side, corporations can tax deduct out the money that they spend. And in fact, the whole regulatory system, the verb regulate actually means to regulate in ongoing use. Regulation doesn't mean stopping something or saying no to something coming into a community. The verb itself means that we're just going to tweak the operation of something in, but assumes that it's going to come in. Why does it operate that way? Because communities don't have the right to say no to things coming in. Uh, Portland tomorrow wanted to pass an anti big box store ordinance, you know, four sentences that says, We hereby ban all big box stores from the city of Portland. What would happen? Well, the first thing that you would get is a big fat lawsuit by, against the city of Portland by Walmart or Costco or one of the big box store corporations. <coughs> 
contending that the city of Portland has now violated the corporation's constitutional rights, right? specifically Fifth Amendment taking stuff uh, and property rights that corporations now have under the U.S. Constitution because corporations now have the same rights as you or I have under the system of law, First Amendment free speech, uh, Fourth Amendment search and seizure, Fifth Amendment takings, uh, due process, Fourteenth Amendment due process stuff by virtue of a series of court decisions that declare that corporations are persons under the law. And so, by virtue of their wealth, they have more rights than you, because we have constitutional rights. But the ability to animate those rights is left to those with wealth, who can actually use them. And so we're in a system of law where a Walmart corporation has more rights than 6,000 residents who live in a town where Walmart is trying to put something in. And it's that structure of law that people don't understand. That very few people understand how the system actually functions, how it actually runs. That when corporations assert those rights to overturn a law, whether it's a state or local level, that that's not the exception. That's the actual default about how the system operates. And to make the story even worse, when a community violates a corporation's constitutional rights, not only can the corporation sue to overturn the ordinance or decision that's been made, but they can actually sue the municipality for damages in the form of future lost profits. So if a community interferes with a corporation's constitutional right, uh, that a, a request for damages comes in and can be granted by the courts against the municipality in the form of future lost profits lost by the corporation as a result of the actions of the municipality. And by the way, that ability to ask for future lost profits to, to secure them is actually borrowed uh, from uh, history in this country uh, that goes back to uh, liberating African Americans from bondage. Uh, the Civil War in the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments and the case law that developed after the Civil War uh, in terms of newly freed slaves being able to seek damages from elections offices that were stopping them from voting. Corporations, because they're persons under the law, have now been able to crawl into those laws that were passed shortly after the Civil War. And so the, the shit is endless. I mean, it is, it's complicated, it's complex, the boys count on us not being able to understand it. And because we haven't been able to understand it as 8,000 moving parts, the only time we run up against it is when we are faced with an imminent harm of our own coming into our community or neighborhood or whatever. And it's only at that time that then the community is isolated, and more or less, because there's no real understanding of structural change that needs to happen in this country to actually liberate communities from corporate control. So what did all this mean for us as lawyers? Well. We were stuck in the regulatory system, we decided to quit. So we decided to close down the Legal Defense Fund. And I don't know whether it was something in the water or the air in 2001 or 2002, I don't know whether things were just getting blatantly so bad that people started, started wanting to push back. I don't know what the, what the deal was at that point in time. But uh, phone calls coming into our office, the, they changed quite a bit. And the phone calls coming in from communities, they would call us up and they would say, well, we have a 15,000 head hog factory farm that's been slated for our community. Smithville Foods Corporation wants to put it in. We, our vision of sustainable agriculture for our community doesn't include a 15,000 head hog factory farm in the middle of our rural community. And they would say, we want to stop it. Our response previous to that in the last six years had been, well, you can't because under the U.S. system of law, if something's deemed a legal use, L-E-G-A-L, in other words, it's permitted and it's legal, municipalities are prohibited from banning those uses, which is also a little known, uh, well-settled law that if you ask the corporate lawyers and the environmental lawyers all agree, it's well-settled law that has been so for the past hundred years, that if something's been deemed a legal use at the state level and a permit's been issued or some other designation of legality is attached to it, that a municipality, which is us, you know, the city of Portland, our municipal corporations, the Ann Hill County, uh, Benton County, Lake County, no matter where you are, that we are prohibited from actually banning that use from coming in if it's been deemed a legal use under the law. Because if we attempt to do so, then we get sued by the corporations for violating their corporate constitutional rights. And so folks kept calling in and saying, we want to stop this, we want to stop that. We gave our little speech, you know, as the learned lawyers who have been doing this for a while. And instead of stopping there, people being happy with being regulatory pawns and being uh, diced back and forth within the regulatory system, uh, and appeal to permits and getting stuck in that script, they, they started asking one word question that we didn't quite know how to answer when it got to the end. And we would say, well, it's, you know, you, you can't do that because you'll get sued. And they would say, well, why? 
And we said, well, it's great because corporations have constitutional rights in the United States today. And it's not limited to just corporate personhood, which has become fairly sexy. But there's a bunch of other doctrines, like preemption, where corporations use our state government, like your Oregon State Legislature is about to do on September 30th, to preempt your communities from actually controlling genetically modified organisms within your municipalities. Uh, that's on the water right now. Uh, both parties have agreed to it, the governor's agreed to it, and so it may actually move through on the 30th unless people get into gear and stop it. So you got preemption, you got corporate personhood rights, you got something called the Commerce Clause, where corporations can sue your municipalities if you interfere with interstate commerce. And then you have this real sick little puppy called Dylan's Rule, which says that your relationship to the state is one of a parent to a child, that the state is a parent, your municipality is a child unless you're specifically authorized to pass law in certain areas that you cannot. And the corporation actually uses that to say your municipality has overstepped its authority by passing something that has no authority to pass under state law. And so we would go through these facets with the community. The community would listen politely. And we would say, well, corporations have these rights. And they would say, why? And we would say, well, you know, uh, starting back in the 1800s, early 1800s, actually, 1819, 1816, in that uh, region, that courts in the United States began declaring that corporations had certain constitutional rights. Right? So it's been, it's been a while. And it's well settled law. The corporations have these rights. And the courts have declared that they have these rights. Right? And so the community group on the other end of the phone would say, why? Well, and we'd say, well, you know, the US Constitution, our Constitution itself, actually made it pretty easy for corporate personhood and other corporate rights to be found within the text because the US Constitution actually elevates property and commerce rights above the rights of people, communities, and nature. In fact, nature's not mentioned in the Constitution. And neither is labor, except for bonded labor, which of course refers to slaves, African Americans. It's the only place labor and of course, when the Constitution was written, it only protected a very small percentage of people in this country, white males with property, right? So women weren't persons, African Americans weren't persons, white males without property were not persons, not to mention cougars and forests and rivers and all the natural ecosystems and features and communities. And so you know, when it came down to it, less than 1% of the active two-legged bipeds uh, in the United States were actually covered by any constitutional at all when the Constitution was written. And the boys that wrote the Constitution were uh, of a certain debt. It doesn't mean they were dead people. It just meant that they thought that the future lie in uh, economic growth, economic development of a certain kind. They looked across the landscape, saw an endless bounty of natural resources, and decided that the best way for the United States to grow and prosper was actually to exploit those natural resources the quickest way possible. And that's what they built into the text of the Constitution. And gosh darn it, they did a really good job because we're still doing it. And we've been doing it for a while. And so we say the community group, well, it's because the US Constitution lends itself to this. Corporate personhood was an inevitability in some ways because of the way that the Constitution was DNA. Because if you're going to give the highest rights to commerce and property, it makes sense to clothe the largest economic actors who do that commerce and property with the same rights. It actually set up a runway. And then over the next 150 years, the corporations just landed their planes on it. Uh, that's in essence how the constitutional uh, structure was set up. And so we would, we would explain this to the communities, and then the community group on the other end of the line would say, why? Well, and we would say, well, it goes back to English common law and uh, <laughs> tax it, that uh, the English put in place a system of law for way you conquer, conquer England, and you subordinate the indigenous people there, and you put in place this English system of law. The English system of law was all about property over people, communities, and nation, because that's what they did. You know, William the Conqueror came in and took the land that was not his. They established a uh, English common law, which generally I refer to as finders keepers. It's a finders keepers system of law. We discovered you. Uh, we're now putting in a system of law that governs you. Then they used it to colonize in places like Barbados and India, where they cut the thumbs off of all the master weavers to make them dependent upon English textiles. It's a nasty little history that we have in this country. It's a nasty little system law that we have in this country, it's that system of law that actually became the U.S. constitutional structure in the United States. So we would say it goes back to English common law. In fact, corporate person is not new. 
goes back to church corporations, goes back to other English corporations, and so long history there of stuff. And we would explain that to the community after about you know two hours on the phone, and they would say, "Why?" And we would say, "Because God said so." We 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 don't know why, right? But that conversation with communities who were unwilling to back off uh, basically became the nugget for our democracy schools, which are two-day trainings of municipal officials, lawyers, and community leaders. Basically, uh, put in a summary format, what is it about this country that we don't know? What is it about this country that we believe it is that it really isn't, right? I mean, it's about, about taking away the myths and the camouflage and how the system actually functions. It turns out in 2001, 2002, people were ready to have that conversation in some ways, at least in Pennsylvania, where we were. And one of the reasons they were ready to have that conversation was that uh, the south central part of the state of Pennsylvania was targeted for about 150 new factory hog farms that come into the central part of the state. Corporations did their jimbo jambo, and they went to the legislature and got a law passed that actually allowed them to come into these municipalities, even though the municipalities had laws that otherwise would have stopped them. So they used the state legislature to preempt the municipalities to drive the factory farms in. That's going to sound very familiar because, again, your state legislature on September 30th is going to take action to actually stop you from doing anything about GMOs in your community using the same mechanism of preemption. And of course, we've had the IV group in our arms since uh, kindergarten. You know, preemption is all about the federal, preempting the state, the state preempting the local. We can't do anything the state tells us we can't do, we can't do anything the federal government tells us what we can't do. And the answer is, how's that working for us? Right? Because when power gets centralized in a smaller and smaller number of hands as it moves up the ladder, it's easier to control. Right? It's much easier when 1,600 municipalities in a given state don't have authority, because then you can just control the state level, and you can actually dictate what we can and can't do within the municipalities where we live within the state. It's a very nice little tool that they have there uh, to use against us. In Pennsylvania, these folks facing off against factory farms decided to ditch the regulatory bullshit and actually move in a different direction. And that different direction was to begin to ban corporate farms altogether within central Pennsylvania. And we explained to them, you know, before they started on that kick, which was the beginning of this work, basically, in 2001, we said, well, you can't do that. Haven't you been listening to us? <laughs> you can't ban this stuff. It's a legal use. The state issues a permit. The factory farms go in you're going to get sued. And you can't do it, you know. You're, you're, uh, it's indignity against the law, right? Because the, you know, we follow these tenets of obedience about federal and state law, and they've been passed, and the camouflage of myth, of course, that all is democratic, that we elect people, and then they make these decisions, and then they bind us, uh, us to those decisions. And we said, haven't, haven't you been followed, man? You know, you got to pay more attention. You can't do that. You're going to get sued. And the supervisors in those areas, the elected officials that we were working with in the community here said, we don't care. Okay? And I said, what do you mean you don't care? You gotta care. You could get sued, your municipality could get bankrupted, you could go through this whole process. And they looked back at us and they said, well, you know, if we do it, maybe somebody else does it too. And if somebody else does it, maybe if 10 other places do it as well. And maybe if 10 other places do it, then 100. Maybe if 100 do it, 1,000 do it. And maybe, just maybe, that begins to stop what's happening. Right? And I saw it. If you think corporations bought free speech before, Now that they're human, they'll buy even. Our guest today has been Thomas Lindsay, founder of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Learn more about them at CELDF, C E L D F dot org. And here in Portland, engage with the community rights movement at community rights PDX dot org. Don't forget you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash populist dialogues to view most of our past shows. And when you're there, click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you will automatically receive an email notification. If you're watching on YouTube, you can help us expand our viewership. Contact your local cable access station and see how you can sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program. 
Most local stations are looking for good material and will welcome the suggestion. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. We want to thank Roger Bates, Dave King, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air each week. And to all of you for watching, thank you. I hope you'll watch us again next week. Bye. Remember NAFTA? The United States, Mexico, and Canada were to benefit from better jobs, enhanced environmental protections, improved trade balances, in order to build a stronger middle class. Instead, American jobs and manufacturing were sent abroad. Mexican farmers were forced to migrate to the United States, and environmental standards went under attack. NAFTA has been a race to the bottom for jobs, wages, and environmental standards. Now President Obama is negotiating a NAFTA on steroids for the Pacific Rim, and he's doing this in secret. What do they have to hide? Call your congressional representative today at 202-224-3121 and demand a copy of the Trans-Pacific Partnership text. We need to know what's being done in our name before it becomes law. Learn more at OregonFairTrade.org and get involved now with the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock Cause I never heard my money talk When a corporation has a colonoscopy Then I'll believe they're human like me